This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural text today is coming a very familiar passage of scripture to me uh, from a version of the scriptures that I read as a, as a youngster. Probably I was 11 years old when I read this through this, the Bible in this particular year in the Living Bible. Proverbs chapter two, uh, 24, rather, in verse 3 and 4. And, and it mentions this, and I, I pray that you, you'll hear with spiritual ears today. But any enterprise is built by wise planning, becomes strong through common sense, and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. And today I'm talking from the subject of building wisely. Building wisely. Uh, notice here the scripture. Uh, it, it really, in, in, in the King James Version, it talks about how that wisdom builds a house and it is established by understanding. Wisdom and understanding. We live in a day and age now where there's a whole lot of information and knowledge, but not a whole lot of wisdom. Knowledge doesn't build the house, wisdom builds it. And so, uh, he says, any enterprise, any enterprise, this is what the, the way that the Living Bible states it. Any enterprise is built by wise planning, wise planning, becomes strong through common sense, and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. This is a formula here that he's giving us to be able to move and, and develop any enterprise. I don't care whether that enterprise is the family. I don't care whether it's the school system. I don't care whether it is your social network. I don't care whether it is your professional network. Any enterprise is built by wise planning. Whatever it is that you're going to build, if you're working in government, any enterprise is built by wise planning, becomes strong through common sense, and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. So I want us to delve into this so that we understand because we've got to be able to build for the future. And if you're going to build something that's going to last, you've got to build the foundations of it right. Remember Psalms chapter 9 that, that reminds us, uh, chapter 11 rather, verse 3, that if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Meaning that as you're taking your time to build the foundations, that's why you have to go back to stuff that's proven and you can't just flow with the culture. Listen, it, it, it really bothers me when I am seeing too much of the church world, the body of Christ, living by the standards and the values of the secular culture. The Bible, this, this is our basis for truth. Uh, you better go back to what, what kept your grandmama and your great-grandmama's marriage together. You, 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 better, you better go back to, to some, to some old-fashioned stuff uh, I mean, that, that is proven, that has stood the test of time. And so I, I want you to realize that whatever it is, whatever enterprise that you need to build, whether it is your business, any enterprise is built by wise planning, becomes strong through common sense and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. So I want us to, to, to look at that. Here's the, here's the first part that we're going to look at. An enterprise is built by wise planning. An enterprise, it is built by wise planning. I know some people are very spontaneous, but you can't, build a, 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 you can't build a family on the fly. You can't build a business on the fly. You gotta plan some things. You have to plan some things. I mean, when you have a child, you need to start planning their education. You need to plan the exit out of your house at a certain time. <laughs> the way you can say bye-bye. 
There is a joy of being an empty nester. It's, it's a pressure if they fail to launch. I mean, any enterprise, the family, the business, uh, you know, the government, any enterprise is built by wise planning. Whatever you want to happen in the future, plan for it. Please don't just hope that something works out and you're going to have enough money to be able to retire on. And let, please trust me. I, I, listen, if, you, if, you're, if it is your goal to think that if you just pay into Social Security and your Social Security is going to take care of you, you know what? You'll be on a fixed income and almost everybody that I know who's on fixed income is always broke. Yeah. Uh, uh, plan your own. Have your own plan. For your retirement and let that supplement any enterprise I just want you to appreciate the wisdom of God's Word any enterprise is built by wise planning by wise planning by wise planning it's some, don't just figure it out when you get there any enterprise is built by wise planning so if you're going to do something well it will require planning if you've got if you want if it's a if it's a a career in sports plan it if it is one in music plan it if, if whatever you intend to do educationally plan it out plan it plan it set some plans uh, there are some exceptions certain things that you can never plan on but you cannot live your life based on exceptions you have to plan by the rules Life has rules, rules of engagement, whether you like them or not, it has rules. Plan accordingly, plan, plan accordingly. Uh, it's not a matter of if there will ever be any rainy days, plan for them. Rainy days are coming. You know, so plan for it, plan for it, plan for it, plan for some days that you're not going to feel well. And, and, and so you got to be able to plan. Some folks can't afford sick days, or not another sick day. Plan for that. Plan for it. Plan for it. Plan for it. And so I want you to notice uh, in the scriptures, notice Romans chapter 1 uh, in verse 8 through uh, 13. This is the apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome. And he says, first, I thank my God through uh, Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times and I pray that now at last by God's will the way may be open for me to come to you I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong that is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned, notice this, I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have among the other Gentiles. Notice he said, I plan to come to see you. I plan to impart something to you. When you're with people that you love and that you value, plan something plan something. Uh, and, and here's what I want you to see just from this passage. I want you to see a few things that the apostle Paul had. He, he, he initially had, Paul had an informed mind, an informed mind. You notice when he said in, in, in verse 8 here, he says, I've heard because of your, that your faith is being reported all over the world. Paul was getting the reports of their faith. He got the reports. He had an informed mind. If you're going to build wisely, you need an informed mind. You need, to, you need to know what's going on in the world. You need to know who your demographics are, who your target audience is. He, Paul had an informed mind. Have your mind informed. Don't just be inspired. Don't just be enthusiastic. Have an informed mind. You, don't even, you have to know what the temperature is. If I'm going to go out in the world, I need to have an informed mind. I need to know what the weather is like. Is it raining? I need to prepare for that. I need to have the right kind of shoes. How many of you know you don't wear suede in the rain? I mean, you, you, you need to have an informed mind. If it's freezing cold, you need to be informed of that. If it's blistering hot, you need to be informed of that so you can govern yourself accordingly. Paul had an informed mind. The second thing that he had that I see here, he had a dedicated heart. He had a dedicated heart. Notice in verse 9. It said, 
God whom I serve in my spirit preaching the gospel of his son is my witness how constantly I remember you. Paul was dedicated. He says, I constantly remember you uh, here because of the dedication of my heart. I'm committed. He had a dedicated heart. Here's the third thing that he had. He had a prayerful attitude. A prayerful attitude. If you'll notice in verse 9 and 10, uh, the apostle Paul, he was saying in verse 10 here, he said, in my prayers at all times, and I pray that now at last by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to see you. Paul prayed. He was a praying man. He had an informed mind. He had a dedicated heart. He had a prayerful attitude. If you're going to build something, you need to have an informed mind. You need to have a dedicated heart. You need to have a prayerful attitude attitude. Why? Because there are going to be some unexpected things that you cannot see that you've got to pray about. Because the Holy Spirit knows everything that's down the road. There must be a prayerful attitude. Here's a fourth thing that Paul had. He had spiritual humility. He had spiritual humility. Notice what he said in verse 12. He says, he was talking about that he wanted to come and impart some spiritual gift. And he says that you and I may be mutually encouraged by one another's faith. Paul was saying, I've got something to encourage you, but you've got something to encourage me. I can learn from you. You can learn from me. It takes humility to be able to learn from others. It takes humility to be able to be encouraged by others. It's one thing. It's a, it's a blessing to be able to raise your children. And then sometimes the children come back and start bringing things and they actually raise you. My dad told me that. I didn't understand what he was talking about at the time. But he says the parent raises the child and then the child turns around and raises the parent. It's amazing. It takes humility, though, to be able to receive and learn from those that, have, that you have taught. It takes humility. You see, you cannot teach a man a lesson that he thinks he already knows. It, it, don't be a know-it-all. Be a learn-it-all. Stay humble. Stay teachable. You can't teach arrogant people. They think they know it all. They think they know it all. And then here's the final thing that Paul had. He not only had an informed mind, a dedicated heart, a prayerful attitude, and a spiritual humility. He had a commitment to planning. A commitment to planning. Notice verse 13 again. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times, many times to come to you. He said, I plan to come to you. You know, if you're going to take a trip, you need to plan. You need to know how far it is because you need to know how much gas you're going to need. You need to know how far it is to see, hey, am I going to drive? Am, am I going to fly? Plan for it. I mean, if it's a certain length of time, you know, back in the day, we used to take a little greasy brown bag because we couldn't just stop any place to eat. We had to take our stuff with us. And, and it's, it's something, and you know, if you get on a plane now, you have to be almost flying out of the country for them to bring you a meal. So you better take your, you better pack it in your own bag. And take it on there. So uh, he had a commitment to planning. A commitment to planning. Remember, any enterprise, any enterprise is built through wise planning. Be committed into your heart that whatever you want to see God bring into your future plan for it. If you pray for rain, carry an umbrella. It is, it is the greatest evidence of your faith that I believe that God is going to answer my prayer. If things have been dry in your life, you know, uh, get, get ready for it. If, 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 if you're single and you're praying for a husband, you're praying for a wife, start acting like you're already a husband. Start acting like you're already a wife. Start acting like it right now. Don't, don't wait until you plan for it. Plan for it. Plan for it right now. Because building for the future includes planning. It requires planning, but it doesn't end in planning. It doesn't end in planning. It's not just planning alone. You know, there's a little, the little allegory that there, there were five frogs sitting on a log and four decided to jump off. How many are left? They, 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 four of them, five logs, five frogs on a log, four of them decided to jump off. How many are left? There's still five. They just decided they didn't do anything. I know people like that that decide that they're going to do something and they never bust a move. They're still sitting on the log. They, 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 they've got the gun and it's ready, aim, 
aim, aim, aim, and they never pull the trigger. They never take the leap. They got their business plan. They know what they want to do, but they're afraid to take the leap. And so deciding it is just not fully enough. It's not enough because you plan, you prepare, and then you execute. You plan, you prepare, and then you execute. You plan, you prepare, and then you execute. Let, let me br bring it into the realm of reality. Uh, if you're going to have a f the family over for dinner, you plan the meal. Part of that planning is everything that you need from the grocery store or from the field. It's, it's everything that you're going to need. It's, it's the list of all of your ingredients. The preparing, preparing, uh, is, is, is what the French call mise en place. Everything in its place and a place for everything. Uh, mise en place, when, uh, the French before they cook, they have every knife that they will use, every spoon, every spatula. They don't get in the middle of something and say, mm, where's my, my, my big spoon? Everything is laid out. Of every kind of dish is already laid out. They plan the meal. They don't get halfway in it and then now I can't find my knife that I use to peel my potatoes. Everything is laid out. Every utensil that will be used. Everything is prepared. It is in its place. It's like a surgeon getting ready to do surgery. You don't get in the middle of surgery and say, where, where, where's the scaffold? Yeah, can you run back down there to my office, look over there in my left drawer on this, you know, on the second, second drawer on the left side and, and get, get the, uh, the, 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 my seven inch scapula. No, no, no. All of your tools of everything that you're going to need, that's, that's preparing. Planning is writing the list. Preparing is getting it all out and it, in its place. Just going to the grocery store and getting every ingredient that you're going to need and laying it out so you don't get in the middle of making the cake and now all of a sudden, sudden you're saying, you know what, I don't have any vanilla extract. When you plan and you prepare, you have everything you need, every ingredient, every bowl, every, every knife, every spoon that you will need, every mixing apparatus. You have everything that you need. You plan, you prepare the items out of whatever you're going to need. Just like if you really want to make sure that you get up and go to the gym in the morning and work out before your day begins, plan it at nighttime. Put your tennis shoes right there uh, at the foot of your bed and lay your gym clothes out. Have your bag already packed, your water in it, and everything that you'll need so it'll make it easy for you to just fall out of the bed and now everything is in place. You plan, you prepare, and then you execute. It makes it so much easy, easier to execute when you have planned and prepared. Am I making sense to you? I'm, this is not the kind of stuff that makes you shout, but it helps you to live so much better. And it brings facility to your life because any enterprise is built by wise planning. Become strong through common sense and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. That's the word of the Lord. And I, I want you to, help, to be able to build wisely, whether you're building a, your family, whether you're building a future, whether you're building your itinerary for a vacation. Plan it, plan it, plan it, plan it. Planning is the proof that you believe in the future. It is the belief that you believe in the future. My friend Dr. Peter Kuzmik said that hope, hope is the ability to hear the music of the future. And faith is the courage to dance to it in the present. Isn't that amazing? A hope, hope, hope is the ability to hear the music of the future. And faith is the courage to dance to it in the present. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the planning. You hear something. The people that become cutting edge are the ones that are hearing the music of the future and they got the courage to dance to it in the present. That takes planning. That takes planning. And just remember that every dream that you have Every vision that you have, every destiny must pass the test of discouragement. Every destiny, every dream, every vision must pass the test of discouragement because there will come something that will try to discourage you. 
that will come to say this is not going to happen. Courage is oxygen to the human soul. It's oxygen to the human soul. And uh, when King David was experiencing a very difficult time, a personal attack, he became discouraged. He became afraid and he began to lose hope. Please don't think that anybody, no matter how upbeat they always are, don't think that it is ever impossible for them to get down. David went through some stuff. He was already, you know, if somebody can see you and they can think you that you're always miss, miss happy, miss cheerful, and you know, say you brighten every room that you walk into. You know that happy people have difficult days sometimes? You know that it's not always just hunky dory and just pleasant and ha ha and you know. They go through difficult things. Life happens to positive people too. Just because you're positive doesn't mean that negative things don't happen to you. And so you can be living your life, planning your dream, and here all of a sudden, here this happens. My, my dad in, in, in building his business, and, and right in the middle of business, his, his business, now he falls out with a massive heart attack. And has three young children and a pregnant wife. What in the world do you do? You still have to have a hope that draws you out of that darkness of despair. To say, you know, God, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me. And see, there are going to be some God moments that God will write himself into the script of your life. Uh, what I call the God factor. That you'll never be able to build this enterprise alone just out of your natural human ingenuity. God is saying, I'm going to put some difficulty in your journey so you'll have to turn to me. So you'll have to look to me. So you'll have to trust me. So you'll have to believe in me. Because I want to make my power relevant. I'm going to be a part of your story because that's the only way that I can get glory. So I'm going to write some gaps in the story. I'll get you out of your Egypt experience out of the slavery, out of the bondage, out of the addiction, but I'm going to bring you to a Red Sea. And you're going to have an army of your past trying to make you have a relapse, trying to come behind you. And there's going to be a Red Sea in front of you and you're not going to be able to cross it. And God told them to go that way so that they would have to look up to him. My faith looks up to thee. Regret looks back. And doubt looks around, but my faith looks up to thee. Oh, God, you lamb of Calvary, my faith looks up to you. I'm looking up to you, God. God will put some difficulty in your journey. You might lose a child. You might lose a spouse. Somebody may get sick. Somebody will betray you. Something negative is going to happen. Somebody's going to swindle you out of money. Somebody's going to tell you, I'll be there to help you. And then when it's time for you to look for their help, you can't find them. They'll say, yeah, I'm behind you. And they're so far behind you, you can't even see them. And so here is that difficulty. And now you're, you're experiencing a dark time of what it feels like hopelessness. David did it. King David went through it. And I just want to show you this in the Bible. So you don't just think that the devil is only picking on you. He loves to isolate you. I want you to see where David was when he was in a dark place in his life. Psalm 143, verse 4 and then verse 7. Notice this. I am losing all hope. This is King David. I am paralyzed with fear. You ever been there? Has God ever called you to do something that was bigger than what you had money in the bank to pay for? He said, I'm losing all hope. I'm paralyzed with fear. I'm losing all hope. This is the king. This is the one... Jesus is known as thou son of David. This is the one that played his harp and serenaded God. And yet he's now admitting, I'm losing all hope. I'm losing all hope. And I'm paralyzed with fear because they're trying to kill me. They're trying to sabotage my future. He said, I'm paralyzed with fear. God, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? Have you ever been to that place? You're not alone. I just wanted you to see from the word of God, David was there. Look at verse 7. He says, come quickly, Lord, and answer me, for my depression deepens. Don't turn away from me or I will die. Have you ever been there? You notice this is King David. 
This is King David. He's, he's going through trial after trial. Life is beating him up. And he says, come quickly, Lord, and answer me for my depression deepens. I'm getting lower down in the dumps every day. You thought you were the only one struggling with depression? He's on his way to the throne. He's trying to get there. And depression is saying, you'll never make it. You'll never make it. And he's paralyzed with fear. Enemies are coming against him. Everything is attacking him and making it look like it will not happen. Who am I talking to in this place? I hope that there are some people that can identify with David and understand that your destiny doesn't have to be canceled just because you've gone through a terrible night and a terrible season that has brought fear and depression in your life. God specializes in being able to deliver you out of dark places and deliver you out of fear and bring you into a blessed hope, a blessed future. God brings you out he'll give you a prophetic word and then the devil will cause circumstances to totally defy everything that God ever said to you and you'll be scared and you'll be depressed but God brought him out because glory the glory of God is often preceded by difficult trials God puts trouble in your in your way because trouble leads to triumph the triumph brings the glory to God uh, glory comes out of trouble. Glory in your story. Uh, and, and so and remember the words of, of, of the Apostle Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12 and 13. Notice, uh, hear what the word of the Lord says. 1 Peter chapter 4. Notice, dear friends, don't be surprised about the fiery trials that have come among you to test you, to test you, to test you. These are not strange happenings. These are not strange happenings. Instead, rejoice. As you share Christ's sufferings, you share his sufferings now so that you may also have overwhelming joy when his glory is revealed. There is a glory on the other side of every story of trouble. There's glory on the other side. Press through the depression. There's glory on the other side. Press through the fear. There's glory on the other side. It's glory on the other side. Press through. Press through. And may I caution you that while you're building your enterprise, while you're working on your enterprise, any enterprise is built through wise planning, never let your work replace your worship. Never let your work replace your worship. Never let your work replace your worship. Here's the second part. An enterprise becomes strong through common sense. And I know, as you know, that we are living in a day where common sense is not so common. I have never seen such ignorance and stupidity and ignorance going to seed as I have in this generation. It, 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 it makes no sense. But I'm not coming into your delusion. I can see clearly now that the rain is gone. When your life is built on what is solid, We don't have a, 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 an excuse to be confused about it, but any enterprise becomes strong through common sense. Common sense. Uh, you know, the, the company uh, Wrigley, they, they were originally a soap company, and they gifted baking powder uh, with the soap that they were selling. And guess what happened? The people started liking the the baking powder better than their soap. So they made baking powder their main thing. And then they started gifting chewing gum with the baking powder. And then the people started liking the chewing gum better than the baking powder. So they then made their main product chewing gum. Wrigley's chewing gum, double mint. You remember the double mint twins? Wrigley. They started off selling soap. And with the soap, they gave a gift of baking powder. And the people started buying, wanting the baking powder, loving the baking powder more. So they, made, they started then producing the baking powder and then gifting chewing gum with it. And then the people fell in love with the chewing gum. And they said, bump the soap, bump the baking powder. We're going to do chewing gum. It wasn't market research. It was common sense 
common sense and they changed their business product that they produced because of common sense. They didn't pay some organization tens of thousands of dollars to come in and do analysis. They had their finger on the pulse beat of where the people were and they saw these people were falling in love with the free gift. They made the free gift the main thing and have still been in existence to this day selling the chewing gum because that was their money maker. That was a common sense decision. It was a common sense decision. Now, listen, for me, for me, let me tell you what common sense is for me. It's not so common, so I have to spell it out. But I just want you to know what, what I, how I, de I define common sense. For me, common sense is seeking God first. You don't have sense enough to know, I can't do this alone. I'm going to put God first. I'm going to seek God first. Common sense for me is seeking God first. Number two, common sense for me is learning from your mistakes and the mistakes of others. That's common sense. You keep, you know, I mean, it, it is... It is, it's, it's a fool who keeps doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome every time. That means you're not learning from your mistakes. Learn from your mistakes and from the mistakes of others. If you see so-and-so making the mistake, learn from that. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Learn from your mistakes and learn from the mistakes of others. Here's the third thing that's commonsensical to me. Seeking to understand a situation before giving your input. Seek to understand a situation before you give your input. Always seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Get the context. Understand what the environment is. Please, it's, it's, it's really important. Some people will put their two cents in and then they don't even know what they're talking about because they don't understand the context. So seek to understand where they are and what they are saying before you give your input. Here's the next thing. Imagining the consequences of something before you do it. To me, that's commonsensical. Imagine the consequences. Now, if mama told you not to do this, and I don't know about you all, how many of you all might have had a crazy daddy, but if your daddy told you not to do something and uh, you don't want to do it, you need to imagine the consequences of something before you do it. You'd be surprised how, uh, how much that will keep your soul just by imagining the consequence, they told me that when I get home, I better have this kitchen cleaned up. And you know that there were going to be consequences. You know that there were going to be consequences. Just imagine the consequences of something before you do it. That's commonsensical to me. And here's another element of common sense is exercising good judgment that allows us to live respectfully and peacefully in society common sense. Just being respectful toward others so we can live together. You can't, you know what chaos is? Chaos is a result of everybody doing what they feel is right in their own eyes without regard or respect to how it is affecting the life of anyone else. We live in a community. We live in society. You can't live as though you're living in a silo. Your decisions impact other people. If I don't care if it's a father or a mother who makes the decision to be an alcoholic, that alcoholism hurts their whole family. It hurts everybody who loves them. When you have common sense, you have to realize that other people are connected to me that love me, that are in my community, that are part of my world, that are in my neighborhood, and I want to be respectful of my neighbors. I'm going to cut my grass out of respect to my neighbors. I'm going to keep my place clean out of respect to my neighbors. I don't want them to say, there goes the neighborhood because I move in. Uh, we live in community. And so it is about living in a way that is respectable uh, to other people uh, so that we can have a peaceful society. We don't want to just come and live with the kind of attitude, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do with it. Deal with it. I'm here now. Deal with it. No, 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 that, that upsets the peace of a community. You see, understand common, common. It is the whole meaning of the word communication, com, common union, communication. It comes from the Latin word communicare, which literally means common ground. It means that we have a common basis in our humanity. It doesn't matter black white, Latino, Asian, 
We have a common humanity. There are certain common human things that every parent wants for their children. Let's build on that common humanity of what we have in common. It's one thing to celebrate differences, but it's another thing to live in peace and harmony out of the commonality of our humanity. We are all human beings. We don't want to live, I don't want to live in a hostile world where men are pitted against women and women are now coming and strong in this, that, and the other, and you're pitting and you're putting a war between the sexes and a war between young people and older people in a war between black and white, we are God's children. We're going to have to give an account to the almighty God. Any enterprise, I bring us back to the word of the Lord. Any enterprise, any enterprise of any society, of any government is built by wise planning. Becomes strong through common sense. Common sense. Respecting common values values the commonality to be able to respect other people who have to share space with us to that's a part of loving your neighbor as you love yourself you don't just do what you want and tell your neighbor deal with it and expect them to love you we have to live by the golden rule you do unto others as you would have them to do unto you but it is respecting those that's common sensical to me it's the golden rule but what we have deemed as common sense is not so common anymore and here's the thing that I would say to you is that if you're going to stay focused in the right direction as you build there are a few things that you need to remember Every culture needs to remember some things. Please remember that the word respect, re means back, spec means to look. When you respect, you're always looking back. If you respect mama, it's because you look back and you, you, you remember her sacrifice for you. You remember what she tolerates. She cleaned up your mess. Remember daddy. Respect is always about looking back. When you respect a person, you, you respect the sacrifices that they made. You respect the contributions that they made to help you to get to where you are. When I think of my teachers that educated me, I have respect toward them. I look back, it causes me to respect them. So if you're going to build correctly, always remember certain things. And here's some things that you need to remember. You need to remember why you started. Remember why you started. If you don't remember why you started, when times get hard, you'll be ready to throw in the towel and quit. Remember why you started to begin with. Remember why you started. Number two, remember those who sacrificed for you to be where you are. Remember those who sacrificed for you to be where you are. Here's the third thing. Remember your heroes and what they stood for. If you ever become confused in who you are, and what you're trying to do, remember your heroes. Remember the character that they displayed. Remember your heroes. And then I would say to you, remember who God is. Remember who God is. You become fearful, paralyzed by fear, and you wonder, God, how am I going to get out of this? Remember who God is. God is eternal. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. Remember who God is. Whenever you're building something, remember who you are. Don't ever build something that is incongruent with who you are. Remember who you are. Don't lose yourself in your work. Remember who you are. Remember the values that are in you that are based on Scripture. And, and then here's the final thing that I would say. Remember what never changes. Remember what never changes. Remember the things that are constants, the laws, the principles that never change. Remember those things that never change. No matter what happens and faddish in one generation, remember the things that never change. Principles, things that never change. Certain things never change. I mean, if we're going to be in community, there must be communication. Now, how communication is done, that's methodology, but that's still, we have a need to communicate. We have a need to be with each other. We have a need for community. That has never changed. How we communicate is differently. 
telephone, whether it's telegraph, uh, whether it's telewoman, it's still, <laughs> it's still communication. Still communication. Still communication. But here's a, here's a remember we, we, we've started out and we said that any enterprise is built by wise planning. Number two, it becomes strong through common sense. And here's the third dimension. Any enterprise profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. By keeping abreast of the facts. Here's what this basically says to us. That what got you here won't take you there. You can't just keep on doing what you've done. Otherwise, we would still be in a horse and buggy today. And it slows the pace at which you've done. It's not change, you know, transportation has always been, been there. The modality of transportation has, has, has changed. We went from being transported by walking on foot to riding on horses and camels. I mean, we'll ride anything, an elephant. I mean, if it's big enough for us to get on, we're going to try it. And so we, we're going to try it. And, and, and see, but we moved from horses to horsepower under the hood of a car. Now to voltage, electrical vehicles, uh, to supersonic jets, to trains, to planes. The modality changes. And all of them have a different speed, but it's still all transportation. Transportation doesn't change. You're designed to go places. You're designed to go places. But you begin to profit wonderfully by keeping abreast of the fact. Keeping abreast of the sack. In 2019, there was a teacher right here in Georgia. She took out um, a $400 uh, travel insurance policy. And uh, because she was meticulous, she read through all of the contract, the agreement in the contract. And they had a clause in it that says, anyone who is reading this agreement... If you will email us now, we will send you $10,000. It was in the fine print of minutia of a contract for some travel insurance for $400. And homegirl saw it and she emailed it in and she was the first one. They sent her $10,000 because she had kept abreast of the facts. It was there for everybody, but I mean, I mean, if you're online, they got some agreement that you have agreed to this. We just click agree. <laughs> Homegirl read every word with a fine tooth comb, and she says, "Oh my God, ten thousand dollars!" And she emailed it in. They sent her ten thousand dollars off of a four hundred dollar policy for travel insurance, and she profited wonderfully just because she kept abreast of the facts. Talking about reading pays. She found it. She found it was hidden for her. It was hidden for her. And may I say this to you? Instead of desperately trying to prove yourself, work to try to improve yourself. Instead of trying to desperately prove yourself, Work to improve yourself. Improve yourself. I love something that Ralph Waldo Emerson said. He said, knowledge is when you learn something new every day. And wisdom is when you let go. Let something go every day. You ought to learn something and you ought to let something go. Every day wisdom is being able to learn how to say, you know what, I'm, I'm finished with this. I release this. I let this go. I let this go. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, 14. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Remember, knowledge is when you learn something new every day, and wisdom is when you let something go every day. Everyday wisdom, is, it, it says, whatever offended me yesterday, I let it go. Whatever hurt me yesterday, I let it go. It's knowing what to keep, what to add to yourself, and it's what to, to let go. And if you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. But if you're de determined to learn, 
nobody can stop you. And there's something about this that every time that you actually learn something new, you actually restructure your brain. It is a process that is called in this neuroscience now neuroplasticity. But your brain literally begins to restructure every time that you learn something new. It's a healthy thing to try to learn something new. That's why I'm a teacher, but I'm a learner first. I'm a learner first. And uh, Irene Peter uh, said that just because everything is different doesn't mean anything has changed. Because the basics of human need, the need to be loved, the need to have meaning in life, all of that really remains the same. And may I remind you of this? Though I'm talking about building wisely, do you realize we're a part of God's kingdom. We don't build God's kingdom though. We seek it, we're told to seek first the kingdom of God. If you're seeking it, it has to already be there, doesn't it? Seek the kingdom. He didn't ask us to build it. It's his kingdom. It is the kingdom of God. It existed before we got here. It is the kingdom of God. We seek it. We announce it. Every time we cast a devil out, it is demonstrating that the kingdom of God has come. We announce it. We receive the kingdom, but we don't build it. We bear witness to the kingdom, but we don't build it. We build for the kingdom. We don't build the kingdom. The kingdom is built by God. And may I remind you of this, because I didn't want you to think that though the scripture says in Proverbs 24 and 3 and 4 in the, in the Living Bible, any enterprise is built by wise planning becomes strong through common sense and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. Just because it says that any enterprise is built doesn't mean that you are the one who really ultimately does the building. And why do I say that? Because even though I'm a pastor, uh, it doesn't mean that I build the church. I don't build the church. It's the Lord's church. It was Jesus that said the words in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. He says, you are Peter. Petros, a rock, a little pebble. But upon the revelation of what you just uncovered, Jesus said, I will build my church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's what Jesus said. We don't build the church. Jesus built the church. It's build your church, Lord. Build your church. Jesus builds the church. We build faith in Jesus. We build our posture. We build repentance toward him. We build for it. But Jesus builds the church. We don't even build the house. Jesus is the one that builds the house. Those are not my words. Psalm 127 and verse 1. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain who build it. Except uh, the watchman watches but in vain if God is not the one there overseeing it and really providing his own divine protection to it. We don't build the kingdom, God builds the kingdom. We don't build the church, God builds the church. We don't build the house, God builds it. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. If you really want to build wise, you build your foundations in God. You bow your knee and you say, God, I can't do this. I give you my husband. I give you my wife. I give you my son and my daughter. They will break your heart. People will let you down. They'll be pulling on you, draining you. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. And you'll see things falling apart. But really, remember, in, in the time that it starts falling apart, and when you're rooted in God, it will fall together better in a, in a way that is beyond your ability to explain it. But God knows how to have you. He knows how to build your testimony. If a sickness comes to you, God has a glory of a testimony in it of where his hand will have come in and sustain you. It is true that whenever uh, people test you in the world, they're trying to test you to see what you know. But when God begins to test you, God is developing your character. And he's bringing a greater dependence in your heart. He's bringing a greater dependence in your soul to say, listen, trust me. 
Trust me, accept the Lord, build the house. Have enough wisdom to know you cannot do this in your own strength. No matter how smart you are, no matter where you've been to school, no matter how many other opinions that you get around the table, accept the Lord, build the house. Accept the Lord, build the house. Accept the Lord, build your family. Accept the Lord, cover your son and your daughter. Accept God by his own power, cover your grandchildren. Accept the Lord. That's why no matter what I know, I have enough sense to get down on my knees and say, Jesus, I know what I know, but I don't know what you know. I've got some power, but you've got all power. Jesus, I trust you. God, build this thing. Build this thing. It's your church. It's your family. It's your marriage. This is your glory, Lord. This is for your glory, for your glory, for your glory. I dare you to take whatever it is that you are building and say, Jesus, I want to be able to build a process to be able to come into what you are building. You already have built the kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. It's his kingdom. He builds the church. I will build my church on this rock. This solid foundation. I will build my church. And the gates of hell. And accept the Lord. Build the house. Accept the Lord. Establish your marriage. You labor in vain. Trying to keep another two-legged human being happy. They cannot help but to fail you and to upset you. You got to bring whatever your house, your church, your ministry, your vision, your destiny, your business. You lay it at the altar and you say, God, build this business, build this family. God, help us. I bring it to you. That's what wisdom does. Wisdom builds the house and understanding establishes it by the power of the Holy Ghost. You've got to trust him. You've got to walk with him every step of the way. You've got to say, Jesus, I need you. I need you. I need you. Jesus, every day, every hour, I need you, Lord. I need you. The crazier that the world gets, the more that it drives us back to the heart of God, back to prayer, back to our roots, back to saying, Jesus, I'm depending upon you. And when I don't know what in the world to do, my eyes are upon you. Build your church, God. Build the house. I don't want to labor in vain. Trying to talk to folks that are stubborn and rebellious and who think they already know. Jesus, <laughs> build the house. I trust you, build it, build it, Lord. God, you do it. I've already done it. I've already said everything that I could say. Jesus, build the house. Build the house. Accept the Lord. Build the house. They labor in vain. They labor in vain. The best thing you can do is after you've done what God told you to do, is turn it over to Jesus. Turn it over to Jesus. Turn it over to Jesus. And the Lord says, I'll build it from here. I'll build it. I'll build it. There is a city whose maker and builder is God. God is the builder of that thing. He is the one who builds it. And we bring our hearts to say, Lord Jesus, search my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. And God, if there's any wicked way in me, God, lead me in the way everlasting. And though, God, we know that any enterprise is built by wise planning and becomes strong through common sense and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. Lord, we know you and we depend upon you. And we pray and ask God, hold us. Establish us firmly upon the rock of the revelation of who you are. And may we remember those things that are unchanging. That are ultimately important. May we remember those who've sacrificed for us even to be where we are. May we remember, God, what you've done for us. 
how you've redeemed us, what you have forgiven us of. May we never forget it. And Father, help us to build a better and a brighter future from here, to be respectful toward others that we have to live with in community. Make us aware once again, God, that we are our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper. We are their keeper as a responsible citizen of the kingdom of God. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, when we have lived selfishly. God, help us to be able to build the enterprise of what you have charged our hands to do in assisting and playing the small role that we play in the greater scope of what you're doing in our life. God, have your way in us and build your church. Build your church. Build your church. The family of families. Build your church. Build your church. Lord, we look to you. Build your church. Make us strong once again. Cause us to give you glory and honor and majesty and dominion once again, God. And remember who you are and what you've done for us. And may our hearts leap for joy and be strengthened in our faith and have our hope strengthened as we move toward a glorious future. God, we thank you and we thank you for your hand that is on everybody that is watching and every person who's here. May you bring to our hearts and our minds what we need to do a better job of building and having common sense to establish God. And Father, being informed about the facts that will help us to profit. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for watching.